Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. This is the Trust and Identity, the Role of Agentic AI session. Uh, if you want to file in from the back, there's some seats up front that you can fill in. Uh, uh, I'm Chris Brown. I'm the moderator of this, this panel. I'm the Chief Product Officer at a uh, fairly young startup, Bonafide. Uh, we're focused on providing agentic alignment for travel suppliers. Uh, joining me today is the very engaging, uh, very smart and very experienced uh, Jillian Jones. She is the head of travel, tourism, and hospitality at Conatus. Um, uh, Jillian, why don't you introduce yourself and uh, tell us um, tell us about your interests in this space and with this respect to this subject? Yeah, thank you so much. And oh, you set me up to fail now, but uh, yeah. So <laughs> Sorry. Uh, as Chris says, no, no, you're 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 yeah, you're terribly kind. Um, yeah, as Chris says, I'm head of travel, tourism, and hospitality, and I really specialize and um, very enthusiastic and passionate about why identity is such a cornerstone for our industry and how I truly believe that by prioritizing identity and you know following the trends that we're seeing within Europe and you know the the emergence of more digital identities I really think that this is is something that's going to be part of this huge evolution that we're seeing within travel and uh, Agentic AI only, only focuses the lens even further on why this is so important. So I'm hoping that today we're going to, you know, price, provide some insights. I think we're going to hopefully create a bit of energy about this. Um, but yeah, we, we need to be mindful of time because we can talk all day about this, Chris, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and, and we've, we have. Uh, where I want to start with this is a little bit different. I don't want to start from the top and build down. Uh, but what I, I think I want to start where, where people are most interested in, and that is namely, uh, you know, as a consumer, what is the future near and long term going to look like uh, for me as a traveler in terms of how do I share and manage my identity? Who is connecting with that? Uh, when is it going to be given out and who are the the partners and the players that are going to be involved in that? And I know you've thought a lot about it. Can you walk us through what that's going to look like, uh, maybe distantly in the future, and then talk a little bit about the transition to how we get there? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I mean, firstly, that's a that's a huge question, right? It's, it's, it's pretty fully loaded. So what I what I think is, and what I believe is in the very near future, you are going to see a very, very rapid convergence between things like Google wallets, Apple wallets, and what we're used to with payments and identity wallets. So you're, so you, you'll find now that people are not, you know, Apple are talking about their Apple wallets, not just Apple Pay anymore and things like that. And we're starting to see language change and we're starting to see some very major players enter this sort of arena. And um, I was on a really interesting uh, call uh, and presentation the other day by Google who were talking all about their strategy for the Google wallet and identity. They are all in, right? So, so I think we're going to see these very, very large uh, known players provide not only the payment rails and the kind of frictionless experience that we've seen with payments, they're going to now combine identity. So you're going to have digitally assured identity and verified transactions, and you will see that come together. So I think that that's just around the corner. You're seeing it in Europe. It's, you know, coming, it's coming thick and fast. I think that um, what's going to be really interesting is when we are in a real world scenario, we're having multiple wallets. So we were talking about this a little bit before. Um, we work very heavily with Microsoft at Candatus. So there is a world where I will have my authenticator app and I will have credentials within my Microsoft wallet, which will be pertinent to my work life, my career, that type of stuff. It will have those types of credentials. And then I might have a different wallet, like a Google wallet, which is my life, right? That's where my, my personal life. So how are you gonna, how is that gonna be orchestrated so that when I'm asked for a credential or I'm asked for a bit of information, there is going to be identity orchestration that's required in there to be able to selectively disclose the pieces of information that are pertinent to the question that I'm being asked. All of this is here. It's now, it's doable. It's just going to be the mass adoption. And to be honest, I think that as soon as I saw the presentation from Google, I was like, right, buckle up. Here we go. This is what we've been waiting for. We've been waiting right. for Google. We've been waiting for Apple because that's what people use today. It's what I use all day, every day. So um, that's going to be the biggest change. So that's that's a now thing, right? And I think that, yeah. as I say, the near term will then be identity orchestration across multiple different wallets when you have different roles, you have different identities or different credentials that you want to share. So, so in that, right, there's always this tension against uh, 
convenience and security. And you're talking about a future of like, I have multiple wallets. One is my wallet that I'm using for my my business persona, one that I'm using for my personal persona. Um, from a from a consumer standpoint, what are what are the things that are going to make that uh, even frictionless? Like, on the one hand, I, I want my information secure. I want to make sure that it's not getting out there. But I also don't want to check every box for every question of like, oh, this is the information that I want to give away. What what do you see coming that's gonna gonna you know provide um, convenience as well as that level of security and trust and confidence in the yeah. in that? Yeah. So I'm I'm just gonna put out one disclose like one disclaimer to start with. I am not an identity architect. I cannot tell you about all of the ins and outs of this. And there are people on this call that I know very well that know more about this <laughs> than I do. However, I think that you know what we're talking about, and it actually comes down to the underlying technology. The fact that a lot of these um a lot of the the wallets and a lot of the work that's going on in, in digital credentialing is all based on decentralized identity instantly changes that narrative right you've got privacy by design you've got consent by design it's a really different way of looking at data it's how that gets transacted it's how it gets moved about and as i say the actual infrastructure and the underlying trust frameworks that it's built upon are are, are intended to provide these sorts of things where you're not constantly ticking boxes where you're not saying yes i authorize this i authorize that da, 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 da. like it is intended to be much more frictionless and that's why it was born right because the current model that we have of large centralized databases of trying to chain these things together api after api consent 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 it doesn't work we know that there's a lot of leakage we know that there's a lot of drop off because of it and i think that decentralized identity particularly at, at its core changes that narrative so that the actual tech that it's built on is is what i think will change that and make it easier to 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 have that frictionless experience got it got it and and, and so um uh, at, at the end of the day, I, I suspect, you know, p travelers are looking for convenience. They're also uh, looking for security. Does that mean in the in the near term, am I am I managing different relationships with different wallet wallet providers? Or do you think we're going to quickly get to the point where, no, nope, all my by edit any all my managed is managed through either uh, Google Wallet or Apple Wallet or some other, uh, you know, whatever Amazon or Microsoft or OpenAI come up with? Or is it is it going to be, now I have to manage a different bunch of different endpoints that all have various parts of my identity? The reality is that there probably will be a bit of that in the short term, but that will improve over time, right? So I think that, you know, there there's still this concept of wallet wars, which is something that I've never been particularly keen to engage with, because I just don't think right. that that makes sense. I think there will be so many different things that we want to use different wallets for. Like, I don't have one credit card, I don't have one bank, you know what I mean? You, you choose what works for you over the course of time. And um, so I think that there will be an element of that over the short term. I think we're AI and particularly agentic AI will be very interesting is because of the types of questions that we will be asking of our AI agents and, and how that kind of conversation and flow tracks, I think that will then be a trigger to then engage with the specific wallets or the specific pieces of information that I then choose to share and at what point I choose to share them. So I think that um, no, Google are not going to own my identity and they are not going to be uh, in charge of that. I will be able to own my identity and I will be responsible for it. Yes, it will be government issued. Yes, there still needs to be that level of, of issuance going forward. But what will be interesting is when you start, uh, when you start with like a government identity, for example, which we know is coming, especially throughout Europe, but even NDLs and things like that. What's going to be interesting is you have that or you have like your TSA kind of approved identities, but then IATA are using that, but then in a hotel front desk, can I use the, the, the identity that's been authorized by IATA? And then that goes through the journey. And the answer is yes. Like that's where it becomes interesting. That's where it becomes repeatable, but it's still my identity and I can revoke it at any time. So it's going to be interesting to see how that shift uh, bottoms out. Right. And then, then from the perspective of the travel suppliers, um, um, how do they need to prepare? You know, some people are further along this journey. Some of the suppliers are further along this journey than others. But how do they need to be preparing for this future of the the combination of largely identity technologies that already exist, and when that meets the agentic, you know, when things start to become way more agentic, what what are travel suppliers needing to think about? Where do they need to be focused on, and et cetera? 
so I maybe have a slightly controversial point of view on this in that um, I would say that most travel brands that we engage with are already doing some really good core identity work that can be extrapolated and applied to these specific use cases. So what we're seeing is, you know, for example, standard identity uh, models, common identity practices across employees. So how are you handling your join and move relievers? What are you doing about privileged access? All of that stuff. How do you authenticate your, your customers? How do you authenticate your staff? All of that stuff is bread and butter identity. And people are doing that today. What we're saying is let's start using that and just applying it to these different use cases. So I actually think that there's a lot of really, really good work that's already in place. It's just that people are not necessarily joining the dots. And I understand why, because it feels big, it feels scary, and it feels overwhelming. So I get right. that. Yeah. However, like we're, we've got the foundations, right? We know that things like zero trust is commonplace across our, our cybersecurity positioning for most of our organizations that we work with. And it's like, okay, cool. So you're saying you're going to assume breach. You say you're going to authenticate everybody. Well, then when it comes to like AI agents, authenticate everything. So it's really, really just about saying, well, hang on a second, like that's just a different version of that. And then applying the standards and, and, and you know, the processes that are already within the businesses to these new and emerging requirements. So I think people are closer than they think they are. It's just about helping them navigate that. And again, that's the work that we're doing a lot with Microsoft and others. And I know that Shane was obviously speaking about this as well. So it's uh, it's a really interesting time. Yeah, yeah. And and on that, that supplier question, you know, the, there's this this challenge because these these systems they're not without their complexity right and and what's coming about is from from all of these um, agent platforms is they're all setting up these multi-agent workflows and the complexity is increasing is is there an increasing security requirement that the suppliers need to be aware of um, owing to like the increase of complexity of these systems yes Yes, 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 yes. This is a huge <laughs> question. Yes. Um, yeah. Like, so, so the more skips you put in the chain, the, the more, the more you add risk, right? So right. what we're seeing and what, we're, what I think is equal parts exciting, equal parts terrifying is particularly with Agentic AI, you're going to have multiple different agents that are trying to perform multiple different uh, acts on behalf of an individual, on behalf of a supplier, on behalf of who knows what during that process. It's already a fragmented, fragmented system. I think that AI definitely smooths the process, but actually if you've got agent to agent to agent to agent communication and trying to make that work, actually we know the LLMs, we know that the models are not 100% accurate. So as you go through each skip of that chain, your level of inaccuracy goes up. And then it becomes a case of, okay, you get to the end and it's like, yeah, I want to transact to that point. But actually you've had leakage all the way through. So do you get to that point where you're like, okay, you start off thinking, right, cool, I'm having this conversation, that's really good. The agents pass me on to another agent, the agents pass me on to another agent. And actually you're at like, what, 80% accuracy perhaps? of that transaction and of that flow. You wanna hand out your credit card at that point? I'm not sure I do. So these are right. the sorts of things that we need to balance out of, we want to move at pace, we want to really see an escalation in this. And I think it's super exciting, but it's an old fashioned, really standard like uh, conundrum of pace versus risk. Same as the old right. cost versus risk model that we had with okay. CIOs. We've always had this course, conversation. Yeah. It's just a slightly different metric. And those are the things that we need to think about. But we know that there are really, really fundamental things that we can put in place to make it way better. Yeah, so, uh, on that, I mean, you bring up a point, we talked about this earlier backstage, is that, you know, you have these chains of agents and these multi-agent systems. From, from, from the standpoint, uh, and, and they're propagating misinformation up and down those chains, from the standpoint of the consumer, what is, or maybe even the supplier as well, is what is, what do you think the level of, 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 leakage across these chains is. I mean, I, I know that's like a, um, a kind of a depends on the use case question, but but what is the target? What is the reasonable short-term target here? Is it 95%? Is it 99%? Is it is 80% okay for most things? Because you'll have a chance to validate it later. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely going to be a use case specific question. Again, you know, it's it, 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 it'll come down to um, 
for example, we do a lot of work and I can see Alex Bainbridge chatting away in the background. So he and I know yeah. each other well. So um, like it'll come down to preferences. So if I have a preference that's not met, meh, that's not great but it's not the end of the world versus if it is something like I've handed out my credit card details and then that is something that's been subject to a hack, like that's significantly worse. So I think the percentage of, of leakage and the percentage of accuracy that you're willing to bear will vary depending on the use cases. But I don't know if we have that data yet. And if anyone does, like, please share it with me. I'd love to see it. Okay. Uh, uh, Jillian, we're out of time. Thank you everyone for joining us. This has been a great talk. Jillian, it's always great talking to you. I'd love to thank continue you. this conversation. Uh, thank you for your attendance. And, and uh, I understand out in the lobby, they're serving refreshments. So if you guys want to file out and grab a refreshment, go, go. Uh, have fun. Thank you so much for joining. Take care. Thanks everybody.